I've been a fish keeper for about 25 years or so, and I've worked really, really hard to not be an expert. So, um, you know, my thing isn't necessarily that I want to know everything about every one thing. I want to know a lot of different things. So I'm always looking to expand my knowledge, expand my experience, and get the PowerPoint slides to work. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, don't feel like I'm coming to you as an expert. What I'm coming to you to do today is to share my experience with building a pond in my backyard, all right? Um, also, if you've heard me speak before, you know I'm extremely, extremely cheap. I have a love for finding the wrong thing to do the right job. So whatever I do, I try to spend as little money as possible. It has served me well in the hobby when I was a school teacher. Some of you might have seen pictures from my classroom where they were lined with six foot aquariums all the way around the room, all through, you know, hustling down donations and people who overpriced their stuff on Craigslist and then just wanted to get rid of it, and trading and wheeling and dealing, and so on and so forth. And in that spirit, I brought a lot of plants tonight from my pond. Um, a lot of those plants I started growing with just one piece that somebody gave me or I was able to find somewhere. So um, are we having a pond doesn't have to be complicated. We got Rachel Leary coming in a few months. If, if you can plan to be here for that, that's gonna be good. She's a great bridge between old school and new school. She's been around for a long time. Chuck knows her from ACA. I, I got to know of her from uh, Monster Fish Keepers when that was a brand new website. She's all over YouTube now. She's really grown and developed with the hobby and the different technologies where we share our hobby. But she's also stayed true to her fish keeping spirit, which has been pretty awesome. <coughs> all right, so my pond keeping adventure started with coincidence. One of my students who loved all my fish tanks also had a father who loved fish tanks and also had a much, 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 much bigger lawyer budget than I did. And he was building a pond in his backyard. And just like me, he's very ADHD. So halfway through his pond build, he decided to not go with rubber liner, to go full blown cement and contractor and the whole deal. So he had these pond liners left over. He said, hey, you like fish. Would you like these pond liners? At the time, I was living in an apartment, so of course I said, yes, I would love these partners. <laughs> and I dragged them around and moved them around for about a year until I got a house, and then I put them in the shed at my house. And then for a few years, you know, my wife said, no, we can't have a pond in your backyard. That's where the kids play. And then the kids never played in the backyard, and then the weeds overcame. And, and one day, um, we'll get to that in just a second. But so before we even get into my adventure, let's get into... What is a pond? Pond is a hole with water in it, right? It can be as crude as, that's a 20 gallon long with water poppy and, and some other plants in there. It could be a Kmart kitty pool with some, some really distinctive landscaping around it. Or it can be something of beauty, giant giant rocks and Japanese maples, big beautiful koi, filled with a bottom of rock and all kinds of different things. I would very much love to have that in my backyard. And if you're saying, no, that's just not what I want, you're probably kidding yourself because that's, that's just the kind of thing you want if you had the budget and the discretionary income for it. So I, I'm not even close to that. Maybe, you know, when I hit the lotto or, or do retirement, who knows, but that's, that's not what I have the budget for, but that's what I have eyes for. This is something that I have the budget for. This is a pond I did at my mother-in-law's house maybe 15 years ago when I was living in apartments and didn't have a place to put a pond of my own. If you look real close, you'll see the pre-made Home Depot pond shell, right? Just real simple. The filter was a bucket with some uh, lava rock in it. It had a really small pump that got clogged every three days. But the plants grew, there was lots of shade there, we had some landscape logs to kind of frame it off. So when I had the chance to build in my own house, I wanted to kind of get somewhere in the middle, somewhere where I could have beauty on a budget, but still with the chance to move towards that, that big dollar, you know, boulder build uh, pond. So here's how I started. If you, if, you, if you recognize that, that's your standard South Florida backyard with sandy soil and weeds instead of grass. And there was, unbeknownst to me when I bought the house, there was a, a big um, big tree in the middle, or what are the rubber tree we call them. And uh, it came just below the surface of the grass. So when we put nice expensive sod back there, there's only about this much soil between the sod and the tree stump, which was about four feet wide. 
So over the course of about a week, I, I bent a pickaxe and broke a hatchet and a couple of things, but we got that stuff out of there, and I was left with this great big hole. It was about four foot by four foot hole, and there's still even more roots in there. You see the roots all the way down at the bottom. So we kept working on it until I convinced my wife that, hey, since we already have a hole, let's start digging a pond. And in case you haven't already figured out, when this picture was taken, my wife was not in the state. <laughs> so uh, I had, a, it was around Thanksgiving time. My wife was taking, oh no, was it Thanksgiving? Or, yeah, it was Thanksgiving time. And my wife was taking the kids to New Hampshire to see the family property there. I did not have a long enough break to go with them. So I stayed home. The first day I ate steak and drank beer. The second day I watched whatever I wanted to watch on TV. And by the third day I was thoroughly depressed and alone. It's a very good thing for a married man to have as an experience to have that freedom and then the crushing reality of, yes, I need people in my life. So at about day four, day five, I picked up a shovel and I started digging. I didn't really have a plan. I did have this crazy cement pillar that was originally part of the plan that was left at the house when I bought it. That was gonna make a neat little waterfall. But who can, who can guess the theme of this talk is gonna be mistakes I made. <laughs> One of the mistakes I made, anybody can figure out what the, the mistake of putting that waterfall feature in there right now is? Is before, before I put the liner in, right? Yeah. I was sweating and swearing and all kinds of things. I almost had a stroke getting that 300 pound piece of cement into the pond. But if you've ever moved cement, it's much easier to move it down than to move it back up. Yeah. So, uh, so eventually that ended up underneath the pond. <laughs> Shoring up one of the one of the ledges going into the deep end, so it's in the pond. You're just never going to see it unless you know one day I redo it. But you can see, you know, I had a real simple plan, and it was to have a squarish pond so I could have as much water as possible. I was going to have an island in the middle, and I was going to berm up a waterfall up in the in the corner there. And uh, originally, I wanted the waterfall to be right over here in the farthest corner. But my kids had a tree they loved there, so I couldn't rip that tree out, so we had to rethink it. And uh, the next problem I ran into is my original idea to burn up the edges with all the dirt I was digging up to have this pond coming up off the ground and not having runoff going into it, is our soil is very, very, very sandy. And it did not clump up, it did not stack up. It was like the sands through the hourglass on the days of our lives in trail. So, so that didn't work, all right? So we had to adjust plans once again. That's me trying not to die. <laughs> exactly. That's that's the same reaction my wife had. <laughs> but uh, it's very important if you're out there working in the sun, even if it's you know late in the year, you uh, keep yourself hydrated. I soak that towel in water every 20 minutes just to keep myself from dying out there. So that was helpful. Also, on day two, I discovered something very interesting. Anybody see up there in the corner? I spent the whole day digging directly under that spot before I noticed it was there. Those are bees. Luckily, I was able to call a neighborhood friend who came in and removed the bees. I guess the video isn't going Now, there it goes. And here's, here's him removing the bees. Notice they're very chill, right? They just found a female, they, they gathered around her. Luckily it was in the frangipani. By the way, I have a frangipani tree in the auction today. And uh, he just cut it off, stuck it in the bead box, and he stuck that bead box in the back of the station wagon and went home with it. I watched from, from the edge of my property thinking he was gonna crash a fiery death into the neighbors when the bees attacked him. But they're actually quite chill. And uh, if you're unfortunate enough to have it in the eaves of your house, that's a problem because you've got to rip apart the house to get to it. But as you can see, it was very easy to remove. A lot of the bees didn't stay with the queen. And within, uh, I would say within 48 hours, all the remaining bees had just left because the queen wasn't there anymore. So it was kind of neat. So back to digging. As you can see, the pond's getting a little bit deeper here. All right. Um, you can kind of start getting a feel for just how sandy that soil is. Um, the back corner was going to be the deep end, and you can see where I was running the wheelbarrow back and forth, and the wheelbarrow would just kind of get stuck down in there. All right, I scraped off a lot of the stuff I had burned up to try to make the island and just had as much fresh dirt as I could, but it left me with a couple of lower spots. 
Now, when you're when you're building your own pond, if you have this perfect plan and you can achieve it, that's great. But part of the adventure of, of this crazy stuff we do is how do we work with our mistakes? You know, one end was a little bit higher than the other. Some ends were lower than I intended. So I learned as I went through some different techniques to help me adjust to the less than perfect areas, which to me made it more interesting. You can see uh, right down here, a little piece of wood. That's an old wooden door that was on my property that I used to just kind of shore up that edge so the sand wouldn't collapse down into itself. Now, I really worried about that sand for a long time, thinking, you know, I'm gonna build this pond, it's gonna collapse in on itself. Fortunately, the water pressure holding the liner up against the sand does a really good job of holding the sand in place. Now, when you get really heavy rains and things like that, you gotta kinda of go and check all your edges because you do have some sand that kinda of falls down to lower spots behind the liner. For the most part, the shape of the pond has stayed true. It was never really perfectly right angles to begin with, so it's not that big a deal, but it's something to keep track of if you have really sandy soil. Yes? Did you dig this by hand, or did you use like a little Take a guess. <laughs> yeah, I dug the whole thing with a shovel. And, uh, and a couple of times, you know, my brother-in-law would come over and help me with his shovel. And it took about a, about a week of digging for most of the day. I would dig for, I would, I would run four loads of dirt, and they'd take a break, run four more loads. And then every half, hour and a half or so, I'd pass out for a while. And then I'd start digging again. Again, I was I was very lonely, so that that helps. Two people working steady for a half week. Now, granted, my pond was 15 feet wide in both directions, and at the deepest part, it was just over two feet down. Okay, so it, it wasn't very deep, but it was very wide. Um, you know, and that's and that's the thing. You know, it's you just got to get there and there and do it. If you can rent an excavator, you can have it done in a day. Um, but again. I'm on the cheap, so I didn't have the budget for a new shovel, so I had to go find like a garage sale shovel. So, so that's where I was. And you can see, that's me sitting down in the deep end. So you can get an idea for how deep that is when I'm sitting on my back pockets. What did you do with all the dirt? That's coming up. <laughs> There's the dirt. <laughs> that's not all the dirt. That's when I started to realize that I was having a problem, all right? And then the pile even grew some more. You see my lawnmower there for scale. Oh. Now keep in mind that a lot of the dirt was made into berms around the pond to build up the level. I was trying to make that big hump for the waterfall, but as you can see, especially right here at the top, when I started getting into the deeper stuff, that's that really fine white, um, we call it, it's like sugar sand, but it's like cocaina or something like that. There's a name for it. It sounds so somewhat cocaine-like. but. Uh, but a geologist friend of mine explained to me that that's like washed down from the Appalachians. So it's it's kind of neat to have it there. But that started about, about 14 to 18 inches down. It was just that pure white sand. There wasn't a worm, there wasn't a root, there wasn't a anything in there. It was just death. So it was very easy to dig through, but it wasn't very good to make shapes and forms. And then I had to figure out what to do with it. Now that pile is off my, my pond is in one side of the yard, then I have my pool, and this is the far side of the yard. That sand would just blow right into the pool. Yeah. So for about six, eight months, I had a layer of sand in the bottom of my pool causing all kinds of havoc. So definitely have a plan with what you're gonna do with the, the dirt when you dig it up. Don't put it anywhere near your pool because you will lose your mind trying to get it out of the pool. And, um, and if you put on Craigslist an uh, uh, advertisement for free sand, nobody's coming. Ah, free sand. If you need free sand, here's what I learned. Everybody goes to the cemetery to get free dirt. Ah, they got plenty. Seriously though, the, the, uh, my uh, HOA meeting, I was trying to hawk the, the free dirt, and the cemetery guy was like, oh yeah, by the way, I can give it to you by the yard. I'll load it right into your truck. So it's like, no one's gonna come in with a shovel and a wheelbarrow and take your dirt, so have a plan. Luckily, luckily, I was able to spread it out over on my front lawn. I had some low spots that I wanted to even out, and uh, that worked pretty nice, you know, and uh, the grass grew right through it very quickly. But it sat there for about a year until I figured out to spread it on the front lawn. So, so make that plan ahead of time. This is me sitting in the deep end, mostly because I wanted to take a selfie, because I'm vain like that. But, um, but it, you can see the different layers. So right at the top, you see there's about 
about four to six inches of actual black rollable dirt. Then below that it gets to be some really loose soil, but still with some darkness, a little bit of organics in it. But by the time you get to this level, which is less than two feet down really, it's all that white sand all the way down to the bottom. And I, if I went down far enough, I would have hit the water table, which is how a lot of our ponds and canals are made. They just dig, the water comes in, and now you have a pond or a canal. Um, where in my neighborhood, I think I have to go down three or four feet to get the water, um, probably closer to four feet before I get water. So I was able to dig down and not hit water. So what you're gonna to wanna to know in your backyard, if you're digging down in instead of building up on top, um, you know, maybe dig a tester hole, go down, a little bit farther than you want to go to make sure you're not hitting the water table for one because if you do hit the water table and you drain your pond it's going to lift your liner up you're going to have all sorts of problems um, also to know what you're digging through if again if i had the budget rebar and cement this problem would have been solved yeah go ahead could you dig a pile of holes and use that water in the pond you you could but it's only going to rise to the level of the water table that's why when you go to a lot of ponds and parks and stuff like that it's got that really severe steep bank going down because that's as far as the water's coming up. And last, South Florida Water Management District is, is plugging up all the exit routes and then it's going up higher, but it won't stay up that high for long. Like after the hurricanes we see it comes up really high. That's just because the ground is saturated temporarily. Um, but for the most part, it's gonna find its level where the water table is. I mean, if you have basically a well. Yeah, like an artesian spring. Yeah, you can get a pump in there and you just have to uh, fill up your pond or Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, if um, a lot of houses in my neighborhood have a well for sprinkler systems and things like that, um, I don't have one on my property, but if I had one, I would definitely want to hook that up for like auto top off and the original fill up. I fill it up with my garden hose. I figured it cost me about 20 bucks to fill it up with, with the municipal water every time I fill it all the way up with 2,500 gallons or so. So I filled this up part of the way and let, tried to let rain fill it up the rest of the way. So it's, you know, it's, it's definitely better if you have access to well water to use the free well water. Um, it's got a lot of iron in it. It's going to make your plants grow like mad. It's going to be a little bit discolored. You're going to have the sulfur smell. Municipal water is nice, clear, and clean, um, but you're paying 20 bucks every time you fill it. Well, you don't fill it but once or twice a year. I probably drain it down and sweep it out and, and clean out all the muck in the bottom twice a year. So I'm looking at 40, 50 bucks a year doing that and then occasional top off with the hose because I don't have an auto top off and I, and I don't want to use a skimmer system. There's a couple of things that, like that. So it is, it is more expensive to use the municipal water, but it shouldn't be a deal breaker unless you're talking like 10,000 gallons or something like that, like the size of your swimming pool. All right, and now we got our first circulation in there. Um, I did that because I didn't know what was gonna eat the mosquitoes. So I figured if I was turning the water over, I wasn't getting mosquitoes and my neighbors weren't killing me. I also went to one of the local canals and got about 150 mosquito fish and put those in there. And a week later, I had 10,000 mosquito fish. <laughs> um, if you have a neighbor with an abandoned pool, you put a dozen mosquito fish in there, problem solved. Uh, the neat thing about mosquito fish is they will expand to whatever demand the mosquitoes put on the water body. So no matter how many mosquitoes get laid in that water, the mosquito fish will eat every single last one of them. And they will expand their population. It'll cut back. It'll ebb and flow, but you're gonna have tens of thousands of mosquito fish. Matter of fact, when I get in there with my bare feet and my hairy legs, they start eating all the dead skin like an expensive spa. And, and once you know what it is, you're like, hey, this is like a $30 treatment. When you don't know what it is, you're like, something's trying to eat. <laughs> so it's, it's, it can be a really creepy feeling because they're not shy. You know, you put your arm in there to cut a plant on the water, and there's like a thousand little mosquito fish eating your arm hair. So they're great for that. Here's the downside of mosquito fish. Once you put mosquito fish in, they're nasty fin biters. They don't die, and you can't get rid of them. All right. I drained this pond down to to nothing, and I flushed it out. I got rid of every mosquito fish I could find. I filled it back up, and there was like a dozen mosquito fish still in there somehow. And then then I had ten thousand again. Um, so you're never ever 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 gonna get rid of mosquito fish. Matter of fact, my next door neighbor, you'll see one of the videos coming up, his pond was, his pool was green. Um, his, his wife was, you know, in hospice for a long time. They basically just abandoned the property for a couple of years. I put 24, I counted them out, I put 24 mosquito fish in the neighbor's pool. 
A year later, they poured bleach in the pool because they got a ticket from the city for the green pool, and all the mosquito fish died and covered the entire surface of the pool. Like, you couldn't see the water. There was that many mosquito fish in there. And they got big, too. They were like this big. It was amazing how quickly they reproduced. Um, so the, the other thing you need to be careful of before you put mosquito fish in there is realize that they will eat every baby fish you ever thought to produce. So my goldfish were breeding all the time. I would see them in the morning, splash around in the water. It was a lot of fun. I'm like, I'm going to have baby goldfish. And no, you're not. Matter of fact, a lot of koi keepers will put mosquito fish in their koi ponds for the specific role of eating all the baby koi before they grow. So mosquito fish are great, but they limit your other options. So make that decision. You could possibly go with guppies. Guppies would look yeah, awesome. Yeah, guppies are nice. Right? But you get that two weeks of cold weather in January and all your guppies are gone. So you know you gotta kind of think of that. Maybe you're gonna put the guppies in there, but you keep your remnant inside, and you just refresh them every year. Um, I will tell you, goldfish eat mosquito larvae just as well as as mosquito fish, so they weren't necessarily needed, you know. But I but I've come to really like them now. Here's the goldfish eating. I was feeding whatever scrap fish food I had at the time. There's some ten year old freeze dried shrimp. These didn't seem to care. But you can see all the the mosquito fish in there, and with the goldfish, and. Uh, this is when I've had them just shortly, and already you can see the color was starting to peak up. They get a really brilliant red from eating all the, the insect larvae in the pond. So if you never thought that was beautiful, that is. We were talking about kept alternate water sources. This is the gutter from my roof going through a piece of there. I was using that for top off for a while. It worked great. Um, the, the problem with that is I was getting debris from the roof washed into the pond. So the little gravel that's on the tiles. And I'm pretty sure they use some sort of copper solvent to keep the the slime from growing on the roof tiles. So after every rain, my pond was like perfectly clear. <laughs> it's like, why did it get so clear? Probably because the copper on the roof. So I kind of cut that out. It didn't seem like it was killing my fish, but I was worried about the, the goldfish eating those little particles when they came in. And I wanted the microfauna, so I was really leery about using any kind of copper in the pond. Copper works great for killing algae, but it also kills insect larvae and things like that. So if you want these super colorful fish eating all the free bugs in the water, it kind of you know, put some negative on the copper stuff. Um, like uh, now you can go out and buy actual cop copper ion generators where they put electricity through probes and it releases copper ions into the water, keeps all your rocks clean, your waterfall stays beautiful, everything's great. But again, you're putting copper in your water. So you gotta, you gotta weigh that choice too. Um, there's a, a tropical water lily, that's a day bloomer. The day bloomers open up about 10 a.m. and stay open for most of the day and close before the sun goes down. <laughs> Um, with well, with good fertilizer, this was recently transplanted and given fertilizers. We got one, two, three, four open flowers plus one, two, three, four that are going to open the next day. So they can be really prolific bloomers if you fertilize the crap out of them. If you don't, you got one flower at a time. All right, go ahead. Um, here's some of the the radicin sort plants just to show how I was using the gravel layer. These these were in a big pot. They did real well. You can see the succulents getting bigger and bigger in here, my wife's garden gnome. And here's where I put in the arrowhead. I started off with one arrowhead plant, and about a month later I had all those. And then this is water poppy, and you can see the gravel filling it. You can tell I'm, I'm really good at the water plants. I got lots of stuff going that's water poppy. There's some water lettuce, some stuff in the middle. There's a papyrus, but I don't cut my grass. <laughs> that's, that's being turned into a gravel path um, in the near future. And I built up a little wall back there because I was going out and sitting in my old chair and drinking my coffee every morning. And again, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It needs to be what you want. I really enjoy sitting out there in the morning and, uh, and drinking my coffee. And yes, a very sharp eye, which leads me to the next point. Anybody know what kind of bird that is? We talked about it already. As a green heron. What do you think he's doing there? He's washing the fish. He's washing the fish, right? <laughs> And these birds are the st most stubborn thing. Here's me walking up to the bird. <laughs> and where does he fly? He flies just two feet past the fence. Like, what are you gonna do about it, fat man? And he's just looking at me. And meanwhile, the female is on the other side of the fence waiting to come back in. And what they would do for weeks straight, I would try to chase these birds away every time I saw them. And they would just circle around and come back. That's a red flame sword plant. That's my new experiment that I got in the pond. Um, that's to see, this is the water iris, where I've been breaking it off at the edge. And you can see it's like destroying the pot. Water iris is, is one of the most hardy plants I've ever come across. 
and it likes the water. There's where I pulled it up to try to divide it up. And this is how I divide it. I hose it down. And then carefully, I grab it like it stole something. No need to be gentle here. And then there's new planes. Wow. And it's also 95 degrees, so I'm dying while I'm doing that. And then, you know, you replant the new ends if you want it pretty. Um, I find that if I replant the old ends, I'm more likely to get blooms in the, you know, because they seem to like the older ones. And you see them all. I spent the whole day just repotting plants and I, I composted about 10 times that much. Um, there's water, there's a water lily growing in a plastic bin off to the side just because I didn't want to throw it away. There's, uh, you know, the water lotus. Those are just roots I threw in there. That's the blue pickerel that's also in there. Very pretty. And this is all the equipment I have on the whole pond. I have a Alpine Amazon Cheapo pump. That's a 3,000 gallon per hour pump. I want to say I bought it under $100, depending on which week you buy it. It's a little bit over, a little bit under $100. There's my Mag 12 that goes into the UV sterilizer. That's the Jibo cheapy, cheapy, cheapy UV sterilizer. Um, I would recommend that if you buy that cheap sterilizer that you buy new bulbs right away because the bulbs it comes with are, they fail very quickly. And that's it, you know, I kept it real simple. There's a lot of other equipment you can get, and but you don't necessarily need it. You just need to decide what your goals are. Um, that's kind of the end of the formal presentation. If there's questions, I can answer questions. Go ahead. And that was great, wasn't it? Let's get a hand.